Hi everyone, I'm Jana and I'll be introducing you to the coastal prairie ecosystem. This introduction is organized into five sections that work together to paint a broad landscape portrait of coastal prairie ecosystems. First, I'll start out with the definition and characteristics of coastal prairies, as well as their historical range in the United States. Second, we'll look more in detail at a few of the key flora and fauna of this ecosystem. In the third section, I'll talk about the ecological functions and values of the coastal prairie. Fourth, I'll discuss threats to this ecosystem. And in section five, we'll uncover conservation efforts. After that broad introduction, I'll focus the rest of the intro on the coastal prairies in the Bolivar Habitat Preserve and other local examples of coastal prairies, as well as resources from readings and lesson plans for you as teachers. Okay, let's get started. Broadly speaking, a prairie is a large open area of grassland. A coastal prairie is a type of tall grass prairie located along the Western Gulf region of the United States. Prior to colonization, there were about 9 million acres of coastal prairie in the United States, extending from Corpus Christi to Lafayette. The portion of Southwest Louisiana was called the Cajun Prairie, which originally encompassed as much as 2.5 million acres of land. The Texas portion of the coastal prairie is estimated to have included about 6.5 million acres. This habitat extends in a band along the coast that's about 75 miles wide and immediately inland from the marsh. From a distance, coastal prairies may look like a large monotonous field, but up close, prairies are a shining example of biodiversity. Let's take a closer look at the flora of this ecosystem. The coastal prairie is home to more than a thousand plant species. First and foremost, the coastal prairie is home to grasses like yellow and slender blue stem. Prairie grasses can be difficult to identify though, even by grassland experts because of their diversity. There can be 25 different kinds of the same grasses differentiated only by the seeds of the flowers it produces. So don't worry if you and your students can't identify grasses on the species level. It's enough to look closely and marvel at what you see. Besides grasses, you'll also find tons of wildflowers in the coastal prairie. Common species include Coreopsis, Blazing Star, and Sweet Goldenrod. The coastal prairie is also home to green milkweed, the host plant of the monarch butterfly. This blanket of grasses and flowers provides important habitat for many species of wildlife. So let's take a closer look at the fauna of the coastal prairie. Common mammal species include nine-banded armadillos, hispid cotton rats, raccoons, coyotes, Virginia opossum, and swamp cottontail rabbits. The swamp rabbit is unique in that it's large weighing as much as six pounds and measuring over 21 inches as an adult. Swamp rabbits eat cane, sedge plants, and other tall grasses found on the prairie and wetland habitats. Swamp rabbits have rough gray-brown fur with white undersides and extra skin between their toes to help them swim and walk through mud, dodging predators like the coyote. Amphibians and reptiles of the coastal prairie include Western Diamondback, Northern Cottonmouth, Speckled King Snake, Western Coach Whip, Gulf Coast Ribbon Snake, Gulf Coast Toad, Green Tree Frog, Squirrel Tree Frog, and Western Slender Glass Lizards dragonflies, and fire ants are common invertebrates. 
The amphibians, reptiles, and insects that inhabit the grasslands would not exist without their natural breeding and nesting habitat just east on the Bolivar Preserve, the freshwater wetlands. It's in these nearby pools through the spring, summer, and fall months that the green tree frogs, red-eared turtles, ribbon snakes, spadefoot toads, dragonflies, and mosquitoes lay their eggs. When they mature, they prefer the transitional zones overlapping and extending into the coastal prairie. Both the venomous snakes and the non-venomous snakes feed primarily on juvenile rodents and adult frogs, lizards, and toads that inhabit the coastal prairie. Last but certainly not least, the coastal prairie is an incredible place to find birds. Numerous bird species call the coastal prairie home, whether as permanent residents or migrant species. Bird species of the coastal prairie include house wrens, gray catbird, indigo bunting, red winged blackbird, northern mockingbird, loggerhead shrike, white ibis, yellow rumped warbler, rose breasted grosbeak, great tailed grackle, great blue heron, great egret, black bellied whistling duck, morning dove, scissor tail flycatcher, Eastern Kingbird, Barn Swallow, Common Nighthawk, Sandhill Crane, Savannah Sparrow, White-tailed Kite, Northern Cardinal, Ruby-crowned Kinglets, Eastern Phoebe, Great Horned Owl, Northern Harrier, Ruby-throated Hummingbird, Orchard Oriole, Orange-crowned Warbler, Wimbrel, Eastern Meadowlark, Baltimore Oriole, and many others. More red-tailed hawks, Northern Harriers, and white and white-faced ibises live here than anywhere else in North America. The coastal prairie is also the final battleground for the last remaining wild population of Atwater's prairie chickens. The most endangered bird in North America, whose number today is less than 60. The birds commonly found in and around the Bolivar Habitat Preserve grasslands are kestrels, loggerhead shrikes, mockingbirds, orioles, hummingbirds, meadowlarks, scissor-tail flycatchers, and harriers. Harriers and kestrels feed on the dragonflies that migrate to the freshwater marshes and grasslands in the fall. Harriers hunt by flying low over the ground in open prairie areas. They circle in areas several times listening and looking for prey. When they spot something appetizing, they swoop down and grab it with their sharp talons. Many farmers in the vicinity like carriers because they eat the mice that damage crops. They're sometimes referred to as good hawks because they pose no threat to poultry as many hawks do. They're also known as marsh hawks. These birds will stay on the coast over winter. When the dragonflies die with the cold of winter, the harriers relocate to warmer climates. They mate between March and June and their nests of sticks, grass, and leaves are built on the ground or on a mound of dirt or vegetation. However, since they nest on the ground, their nests are in danger of being trampled by cattle. The number of harriers on our coastal prairies has declined because of human uses of the land. Permanent res resident birds of the coastal prairie include the loggerhead shrike, mockingbird, and meadowlark. These birds breed in the grasslands in early spring and their juvenile phases range between May and December. Loggerhead shrikes are small and have a fancy black mask over their eyes. They're known as butcher birds because they impale things like lizards onto thorns and barbed wire to eat later. They can be found all year perching on tops of trees, telephone wires, and posts. 
Providing habitat for wildlife is one of the main ecological functions of the coastal prairie ecosystem. Additionally, this habitat serves three other important functions. First, coastal prairies provide flood control. When heavy rain comes through the prairie, water is soaked up by the hydrophilic or water-loving soil. This soil contains clay-like particles that are very absorbent. Thanks to coastal prairies, water that might otherwise become urban runoff is allowed to percolate down and recharge our groundwater supplies while also protecting our homes from floods. Prairies also serve as wonderful filtration systems. The roots of the prairie plants have a symbiotic or beneficial relationship with bacteria that filter out chemical pollutants, cleaning our water and improving its quality. Additionally, coastal prairies reduce erosion. Prairie plants have extremely deep roots that hold onto the soil. In fact, prairie roots can grow up to 15 feet long. If we planted a prairie plant in the roof of our classroom, the roots would grow all the way down to the floor. Unfortunately, of all the ecosystems in the United States, coastal prairies are the most endangered. In fact, over 99% of the coastal prairie has been nearly eliminated by development and agriculture. Moreover, the remnant coastal prairie left today is also greatly threatened due to a loss of biodiversity from fire suppression and overgrazing by cattle. Let's start with the problem of urban development. This is by far the largest threat to coastal prairie ecosystems because close to 50% of the population in Texas lives 50 miles or less from the coast. This means there's pressure to build more homes, businesses, and roads near the coast. And as our human population continues to expand, the threat of urban development only intensifies. Beyond development, another, another major threat to coastal prairie ecosystems is agriculture. Because the soils in the prairie contain lots of clay, they're very good for certain kinds of farming, such as rice farming. But the modern method of rice farming involves plowing the land, which destroys the prairie. Additionally, herbicides used on farms to prevent weeds from growing also prevent prairie plants from returning. Likewise, pesticides used in agriculture to kill plant pests also cause problems for the coastal prairie. When pesticides travel up the food chain, they multiply in concentration in a process known as biomagnification, which almost led to the extinction of the brown pelican, the bald eagle, and a few other bird species. Fire suppression is also a problem for the coastal prairie. The prairie needs fires to keep trees and bushes from taking over and to help seeds germinate. Without fire, the prairie gets overgrown with trees and shrubs, which crowd them out and don't give them enough sunlight. Lastly, the coastal prairie gets degraded by cattle. Unlike the American bison, cattle can harm the prairies as they graze. American bison and native species of grazers don't hurt the prairie because they only eat the tops of the grasses. Cows, however, eat plants lower down, pulling out the roots. In addition, they're picky eaters, which means that they target certain plants until they're gone. Fortunately, prairie restoration is gaining interest in parts of Texas and Louisiana. Restoration me methods vary and may involve, one, preparation by herbicide, solarization, or tillage, two, planting by haying, seeding, sodding, or transplanting, and three, management by mowing, irrigation, grazing, and fire. Fire, or prescribed burning, is an important strategy for prairie management, but one that requires a great deal of expertise and experience to conduct safely. Prescribed fire can remove plant litter and woody vegetation. Grazing can be a flexible and useful tool for managing plant diversity, but grazing can be difficult on small prairies of under 20 acres because the amount of space grazing animals need. 
Conservation work also involves the treatment of invasive species. Through the use of herbicides, pesticides, hand removal, and other techniques, harmful invasive species can be taken out of an ecosystem. Common invasive species in the Texas coastal prairie include Chinese tallow, deep-rooted sedge, and guinea grass, among others. For more information about invasive species on the coastal prairie, including lesson plans, activities, and projects in citizen science, please visit texasinvasives.org. In the time remaining, let's turn our attention to the Bolivar Habitat Preserve. The coastal prairie environment borders on the southern portion of the Bolivar Habitat Preserve, running across the top ridges of ancient dunes. It's distinguishable from the freshwater marsh by its elevation and inundation. At any time, a heavy rain or flood can turn a coastal prairie into a marsh. Conversely, a sustained drought can transform a marsh into prairie grasslands. There are three types of prairie grasslands in the Galveston Bay area. The grassland prairies, which are cousins to the blue stem prairies found further inland, the wet coastal prairies that surround freshwater marshes, and the salt prairies that have high groundwater levels but usually encircle salt marshes. All of these types appear on the Bolivar Peninsula. The Bolivar Habitat Preserve that borders the southeast portion of the preserve is a combination of blue stem and wet coastal prairie types. This coastal prairie is an upland tall grass prairie just inland of a coastal freshwater marsh. Prairie plants such as this green milkweed, little blue stem, goldenrod, Indian grass, Texas coneflower, prairie coneflower, and wisache dominate this grassy landscape. Because these grasses have dense fiber, fibrous root systems thriving underneath a tightly woven sod layer, each tuft sends out underground runners or rhizomes that pop up far and wide distances from the source. This growth pattern prevents woody plants like trees and shrubs from taking root. In addition to the coastal prairie of the Bolivar Habitat Preserve, there are a variety of other places you might consider taking your students to explore coastal prairie habitat. The Texas City Prairie Preserve is a 2,300-acre preserve established by the Nature Conservancy. Over the years, Texas City Prairie Preserve has become a region-wide model for native prairie restoration, native seed growing, and the benefits of natural infrastructure. Learn more about the Texas City Prairie Preserve and other Nature Conservancy preserves across the nation at nature.org. The Katy Prairie is another great place to experience the coastal prairie ecosystem. Since 1992, the Katy Prairie Conservancy has been working to protect the prairie for people and wildlife while there's still time. The Katy Prairie is the largest local land conservation organization by acreage in Southeast Texas. The Katy Prairie Conservancy now protects over 24,000 acres of coastal prairie in Texas. Learn more and discover a wide array of learning resources for you and your students at katyprairie.org. Armin Bayou Nature Center is one of the largest urban wilderness preserves in the United States, containing 2,500 acres of the natural wetlands, forest, prairie, and marsh habitats once abundant in the Houston and Galveston area. A, B, and C is home to over 370 species of birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. Armin Bayou Nature Center offers hiking, trails, exhibits, field trips, scout programs, birding, a historic farm, and fun for all. Discover more at abnc.org. Here are some more resources for you as teachers. 
Number one, Houston Wilderness works with businesses, environmental and government interests to protect and promote the 10 diverse ecoregions of the 13 county area around Houston, Galveston Bay and the Gulf of Mexico, including coastal prairies, forests, wetlands and waterways. If you want to learn more about our local ecosystems, go to HoustonWilderness.org. Number two, the Citizens Environment Environmental Coalition. Before becoming a city, Houston was once a coastal prairie ecosystem. Here you can find a variety of resources for teaching about Houston's native prairie habitat in your learning environment. Go to hereinhouston.org slash coastal dash prairies. Number three, Texas Beyond History is a public education service of the Texas Archaeological Research Laboratory at the University of Texas at Austin. Its purpose is to interpret and share the results of archaeological and historical research on the cultural heritage of Texas and the citizens of Texas and the world. To learn about native peoples of the coastal prairies and marshlands in early historic times, go to beyondtexashistory.net slash coast slash peoples. Number four, the Coastal Prairie Partnership promotes the conservation and restoration of coastal prairie ecosystems and fosters a more connected and empowered prairie community in coastal Texas and southwest Louisiana. If you want to participate in local prairie conservation and restoration events, go to prairiepartnership.org. To get your students actively engaged in citizen science, you may also wish to utilize the following resources. Number one, iNaturalist. It's a joint initiative of the California Academy of Sciences and the National Geographic Society. You can use iNaturalist to observe and contribute to biodiversity science from the rarest butterfly to the most common backyard weed iNaturalist shares your findings with scientific data repositories like the Global Diversity Information Facility to help scientists find and use your data. All you have to do is observe. Start by downloading the iNaturalist app. And two, eBird. It began with a simple idea that every bird watcher has unique knowledge and experience. eBird's goal is to gather this information in the form of checklists of birds, archive it, and freely share it to power new data-driven approaches to science, conservation, and education. eBird is the world's largest biodiversity-related citizen science project, with more than 100 million bird sightings contributed each year by eBirders around the world. To get started, download the eBird app. Well, that brings us to the end of your intro to Coastal Prairies. I hope that was helpful. Thanks for joining in.